We're just staring at you. Thank you. Okay. Yay! Yay! So, tell us why we're here, Dustin. Okay. We are here for Hacking 101. Has anybody ever been to these hacking panels before? Show your hands. Okay. What's 101. Who's new? Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Right. All right. Woohoo. Now we can do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Um, we're going to go ahead and do the Dragon Con charity. Um, what is it again? Arthritis Foundation. Arthritis Foundation. Are we? You guys know, a dollar, a dollar. Everything you guys donate, Dragon Con matches. We did $260,000 last year to the charity. <laughs> so, EFF, being socially responsible folks that we are, put a buck, put five, put ten. Are we for or against our friends? <laughs> <laughs> we want to help with the when, when I'm 60, I'm against it right now. Which is the good? Pizza, we love pizza. <laughs> All right. So, um, we're going to start off with sort of uh, what is hacking for the newbies. Uh, what I will say here is anything you hear, don't take it as legal advice. <laughs> don't sit here and try anything you may None see in these panels. Lawyer, that's sure. Sure. None of us against anything other than your own system. Probably illegal advice. It's definitely untrustworthy advice. <laughs> Talk to your lawyer. Maybe you should introduce us or have us introduce ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and let them introduce themselves. Uh, I don't know who this guy is, so uh, whoever you are, kick it off. All right. Um, Brew Myers. I've uh, been known as Johnny X for a long time. I helped start the EFF track back in 1999. I also ran the space track and the science track when it was one track for a while. Um, when space track split off from it, I ran the science track for many years after that. And I helped start the skeptics track. Um, that's my Dragon Con bona fides. I'm a social engineering type person. Uh, we can get into the piano hack I did at the Hyatt or the way I hacked my way into a DJ job at a radio station for many years before anyone realized I had no business being there. Um, I figured out a way kind of through social engineering to go back to school recently for free and uh, surprised the hell out of me that I'm actually good at it. So I'm currently a triple major in computer science, data science, and astrophysics. And um, I will be going into detail during Hacking 201 about my senior project, which I hope will get me free grad school, about building low-cost um, sky monitoring camera systems out of Raspberry Pi 5s to track meteors, meteorites, and fireballs. Yeah. I'll be happy to talk to anyone else afterwards about going back to school, um, doing that, and continuing my education is the best thing, but also one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. And if you've ever been thinking about going back to school and getting a degree, uh, I highly recommend it, and I'll talk to you later. Go ahead. Uh, I am Isaac Sheff. I, I guess I'm here representing a more academic route, so I have a PhD in computer science. I currently do research in distributed systems uh, for so a Swiss company. And um, I'm not sure what to do from there. <laughs> that works. All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, Xavier Ash. I've um, uh, been uh, hacking since the 80s, got a job in security in the 90s, so you make of that what you will. Um, I, you know, I ended up going kind of the, uh, the IT, security, infrastructure, engineering, architecture route, so I'm kind of blue team. A little bit of everything as we'll go into both into 101 and 201. So I'm just I'm happy to see everybody come out here to you know when there's awesome parties going out there, y'all are in here talk about hacking. This is fun. Thank you. Um my name's Grady DeRosa. I'm a senior penetration tester and red teamer and uh specializing in internal network pen tests and social engineering and uh Industrial control systems. So let's be. Yeah. Hey, everyone. I'm Jesse. I'm a safety engineer at Ocean Gate. Sorry, that's my costume. I'm a cyber threat intelligence analyst. Uh, work for Mandian. Uh, before that, I was in the Air Force doing offensive cyber operations. So happy to come here and chat with y'all. 
I like how you still identify the Mandiant employee. <laughs> Sorry, Mandiant now part of Google Cloud. There we go. It's, it's a Google guy. Right. Hey, everybody. Um, my name is Rich Gatz. I'm a vice president of cyber claims at Arch Insurance. Um, also a data privacy uh, attorney. So I've been lucky to participate on this forum for a couple of years now. Um, I won't be so much providing things from a technical perspective, but hopefully from a quasi legal one. Um, so yeah, thanks. Sorry, we don't have enough room. You want to my No, I mean, well, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is this two? Is this two hundred one? No, that's two hundred one. Wait, two hundred one. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and move on here. Um, all right, starting with Drew here. Uh, what is what do you view hacking as? Basically, the exploration of systems, usually complicated systems. They don't always have to be computer systems. Figuring out how they work, maybe undocumented things associated with them, um, non-destructively, and ideally, if you can figure out things that the designers don't know or didn't intend and you can demonstrate them in a funny but not destructive way that's kind of like the ideal hack there are a lot of definitions and if we look old school enough the definition of the word is more or less typing partially because of noise typewriters make. and if you go to mit i believe the definition is uh, using buildings in ways they were not intended which mostly involves climbing up empty spaces inside of buildings but I like the definition of using technology in ways in which it was not intended, more or less as you said earlier. Really. So I've been in the, uh, um, the financial space for a couple of years, and it's interesting because there's fraud and security, and it's always interesting the inter the difference between the two. So and, and so I'll, I'll give the answer from the, uh, from the financial side is that uh, fraud is 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 is, is using is using the system as is intended to do bad things. And then hacking is 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 making that system doing things it wasn't supposed to do to begin with. So you know you know hacking a website to to get in you know through a backdoor or something along those lines uh, versus fraud. And and like I said in the financial world is you know convincing somebody to give you their money because you've tricked them. So that's one area, one industry that kind of delineates between you know that that kind of difference there. And so just wanted to bring that perspective. Um, hacking, um, yeah, like you guys said, it's uh, just using a system in a way that it wasn't intended for a certain goal, um, usually to destroy or to modify or to disclose and leak something. Uh, for me, personally, hacking is kind of a source of feeling alive and being happy. So, so I would add to even like a, a more base level understanding of it is unauthorized access. All right. So it doesn't really matter your intent because you have white hat, gray hat, black hat, things like that. But are you accessing a system that you shouldn't have access to? And so when I think about hacking and when I talk, you know, because I deal with a lot of different threat actors in my day to day and also law enforcement entities, you know, the, the penalty from like the black hat from compromising an email account is the same thing as like compromising a domain controller and implementing some ransomware malware, right? So when I think of hacking, it's, all right, should I have access to this? No. Did I get access to it? Maybe. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of like where I go. I, th I think the other panelists covered it pretty well. I would, I would just sum it up as that hacking is using a device or a system to its full capabilities uh, that, that might be more than it's intended for. Uh, but just, yeah, using every feature, documented or otherwise. And, and whether you do that for good or for evil, it's up to you. By the way, can the folks in the back hear me okay? Do I need to get closer? Yeah. As they say, eat the mice. Eat it. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you for the display here. <laughs> okay, so what is the, in your opinion, your best hack that would not get you in trouble that you can actually say that would be, uh, go on YouTube, so. 
So Vanderbilt University used to have the most powerful and far-reaching student operating uh, radio station in the southeast, basically north of Atlanta and um, pretty much south of Chicago. We were 15,000 watts. We covered 70,000 square miles. And um, I listened to the station a lot when I was in high school, finished up high school in Tennessee. When I came back to the Nashville area um, in the late 80s doing roadie stuff, started listening to the station a lot again and began wondering how I could get involved with it. And we tried to do it legitimately at first and was told, no, you had to be either a student, uh, alumni, or faculty and staff. And I was like, well, okay, that sucks, but I've got, sorry, uh, I've got this Brody gig I'm doing, and I'm over 21. The, age, the drinking age in Nashville um, had been, Tennessee in general, had been raised from 18 to 21 a couple of years earlier. So I'm like, I've got stuff the students want. Access to the local rock and punk shows and booze. So how can I leverage this? And I just showed up at a student DJ meeting and talked to what was called the executive staff. Those were the outgoing seniors. And long story short, um, I think it was two cases of Guinness, um, Port of Jack Daniels, some tequila, and they wrote down that I was alumni and said, when we graduate, no one's ever going to look at this again. Um, it'll just go into a storage container somewhere, filing cabinet. And as far as anyone else is concerned, you're Vanderbilt alumni, and we're graduated, so we don't care. And that's how I became an award-winning DJ at WRVU National. And it took them about five years to figure out I had no business being there because I was not associated with the university in any way. And I didn't realize it, but I was one of about a group of a dozen people um, who were similar to me. We had no relationship with the university, but we were the ones who kept the radio station on the air in the summer when the students were mostly gone and over Christmas break, spring break, and we had all the institutional knowledge and did training. And so we didn't know about each other. We all thought we were alone. And when someone finally figured out who are all these people? They're not associated with the university, but they're like one of the most vocal voices in all of Middle Tennessee here representing Vanderbilt. We've got to get rid of them all. And they realized if we did that, the station would not be on the air. The minimum hours required for the FCC, especially during breaks in the summer, and we would lose our license. So they made a fourth category that was select volunteers from the local listening community. And I was a DJ for another six years there until I moved down here. Let's get a piece of was eventually shut down about eight years ago and is now um, an NPR station. and. Um, NPR has been doing this thing for about 20 years where they go into a marketplace and they will shut down um, through any means necessary the local student radio station and take it over so they can have a 24-hour news station and then um, a music station which may be classical music, may be jazz. In Nashville's case, it's NPR's idea of what a college music station should be like and it's really fun. <laughs> so you say R R D U because you're in Raleigh, right? Uh, no, W R B U. R B U. So, yeah, but yeah. but I guess G P B or what was it? X, uh, what was the station here that also had the same situation? Uh, Georgia State University. University. As soon as they got up to a hundred thousand watts, NBR came in and tried to do the same thing with them. The case is still ongoing. Yeah. But for right now. Um, the NPR affiliate here takes over the uh, Georgia State University system and their new upgraded 100,000 watt transmitter um, for something like 75% of the time during the week. The students are only on from, I think, around midnight to 6 a.m. They usually, but they might have, you already have WABE, you have the same program. Ruin the student program. Yeah, uh, the guy who they brought in and eventually wound up shutting down WRBU up in Nashville um, had tried to do, he he did the same thing at Rice University out in, where is that, Texas, I think, and he tried it at several other universities. WRBU was the first one where he succeeded. 
Um, the local NPR um, affiliate here tried to do originally the same thing to Georgia Tech's radio station, and Georgia Tech fortunately told them to go fuck themselves. So, uh, yeah, NPR, I kind of see the need for some of the programming, but NPR, the organization itself, pardon my French, they're a bunch of fucking bitches. They will never get another dime from me. I'm sorry for the mob uh, monopolizing. <laughs> go ahead. I'm done for now. Well, let's see. My, the hack I'm most proud of, the hack I'm most proud of probably is uh, when I published a security conference in 2016. So I found a way to uh, to get a novel information leak to use information in a distributed system in a way that has not been used before. So in um, a database system, you have a notion of an atomic transaction. It's something that happens all or nothing. So you might imagine I want to book a, a train ticket. Uh, and get a hotel room, and I want either both or neither. I don't want the train ticket and then not have a hotel when I get there. And if they're on different computers, there needs to be this communication between those computers where they talk to each other and say, are you going to do the transaction? Yes, I'm going to do the transaction. There's this lock and then unlock to phase come in set up. And the thing is that if it turns out that the hotel room is booked, um, the train system finds out. It gets what's referred to as an abort message. So we called this an abort channel and tried to see what kind of information we could leak through it. Well, if you're running uh, your system across a database with different, you know, security fields, where the train system and the uh, um, hotel system aren't supposed to know which hotel rooms are booked or which train tickets are booked, then you could leak information pretty directly in aborts. We started using a hospital example. We had a transaction where uh, you're checking if a patient in, in one database is HIV positive and in another database looking up their address and, and if so, sending them information about the latest treatment or something. And you can imagine an attacker who, in the presumed less secure database about the, the patient addresses, who's not supposed to have access to whether the patient is HIV positive, goes and does a transaction that touches those addresses to see if it gets an abort at the same time. And in, in doing so, effectively learns who in, in our hospital has HIV. So we published a paper about this, this novel uh, leak of information of which channels, and also a uh, protocol for committing transactions without abort channels, although we proved that you can't do it for all transactions. So to some extent, this is inevitable. And to some extent, in the special case of most programs you'd ever want to run, uh, it can be defended against. All right, so thinking through it, like I said, I've been on the blue team side so much, it's, it's, it's interesting to see which one I'm talking about, proud of. And think about the one I, I like to brag on the most because it was the first of, of, it, of something. Uh, two, I think his year was 2000 uh, or 2001, and uh, I was working third shift at uh, a, company, a division of Sprint called E Solutions. We were uh, we were cloud before cloud was was a name, right? It was uh, we we provided you know computing for all sorts of companies, including Yahoo. And Yahoo, uh, you know, we, we we got some alerts going off that we got lots of traffic. Now this is third shift. Weird shit happens on third shift. We see all sorts of things break in weird ways. We have ice storms and whatnot. So we had these these alerts go off, and we looked at the alerts. We looked at the data. Ah, uh, sensors off. There couldn't be that much data going to Yahoo in the middle of the night, right? And we looked at it, and we we started figuring out ways of trying to fix it. So we turned, we we adjusted some routing. We moved it through uh, through another data center. We flopped it over. You know, you fail over. You know, I have, a, you have these playbooks. You go through it, and I just could not figure out what to do. And the traffic was just still coming, and it was coming from everywhere. And so what we were experiencing was the first distributed denial service attack. Didn't know that at 2 a.m., and that was quite fun to figure out how to, uh, you know, we, we eventually, you know, found a token in the, the packets that they were sending. And we were able to get that out to the routers and, and uh, uh, set up a uh, identifiers in basically what we eventually, which eventually would become DNS back black holing to look for these uh, flags in the request and uh, redirect them to a black hole. Uh, so yeah, it was uh, his name was Mafia Boy. It was was who else fighting at the time? You could look him up. Uh, and so yeah, I got to defend against the first distributed denial service attack. Uh, yeah, middle of the night. That was fun. Cool. Cool. Um, I guess for me, um, kind of recently on a pen test against a private college in Massachusetts, um, it was a social engineering phishing campaign. 
And um, I got about 45% of all of their faculty to submit credentials and MFA tokens. Um, so I pretty much owned their entire college. And But but it was through a, a $50, a fake dining voucher. And that, um, and then their HR department, their their phones were blowing up because they were like, where's my dining voucher? <laughs> and, I, and I looked up restaurants that were near their college. And so they were all stoked to go to their, you know, I, people just really want to go to fancy restaurants and they're, they're pissed when they find out it's fake. So, um, but through that, they were able to get more funding for their security program. So never waste a good crisis. <laughs> Beating people with free food, that's just cold. Well, so yeah, the probably the oh, thank you, thank you. Speaking of, <laughs> these ones are not a fishing test, they really are free, and they really, they really aren't real. Are they really free? Once I'm just speaking, I'll take mine. Uh, um, all right, so uh, the, the one that I'm most proud of, uh is classified and i'm neither rich nor famous enough to just spill classified information so sorry uh but the the one i can talk about that i think is the most fun was in uh in college i had a, a project where our, our team's goal was to basically turn off a drone uh so it's unable to you know continue operating which if you watch like news from ukraine and uh such that sort of thing is becoming more and more relevant because any drone you can take out with electronic warfare, you don't have to shoot something expensive or dangerous at. So that's that's good. Um, I know that sounds cool, but it's actually really, really easy with this one uh, particular drone we were using. Uh, it was using a Wi-Fi connection to be controlled. Uh, they didn't put a password on that Wi-Fi. So then uh, it's supposed to be the controller device. I guess I have one for my Ocean Gate costume. So. You have the controller and then you have the drone and they have their Wi-Fi. And I guess the designers thought that nobody would bother connecting to this Wi-Fi, uh, but it was my job to bother with it. So you can just uh, join and then, you know, you scan all the nodes in the network. Uh, port 22 is open on the drone. Google name of drone default SSH password works. Log in. First command I give it, shut down. It turns off. It's running Linux on the drone. <laughs> It's a brick. <laughs> Too easy. It's not going to work on all of them. A lot of a lot of drones are smarter than that. But I, I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, it just yeah, it goes to show. I guess it, you know we're using the the Wi-Fi signal in a way that uh, the original designers probably didn't expect anybody else to join the network. Why would you do that? So again, not coming from a, a technical perspective, but I I handle um, or lead a team that handles cyber insurance claims. So network security breaches and similar. And so the one that jumps out at me was uh, I had an insured call in and they said, we just had um, someone intercept some emails, which doesn't happen, right? Like you have man in the middle attacks, things like that, but no one's like packet sniffing a small professional services firm in Raleigh, okay? Like it's just not happening. And so we did some investigation and come to find out that the company put their CEO and like their bookkeeper, all of their information on their website, their about page. And so someone emailed the bookkeeper from the CEO's email account with his actual name, but the actual email address was officepresident2017 at gmail.com <laughs> and said, will you please send this wire transfer? It's really important. It's a big business deal. And as you look through the email chains, Gmail actually caught the spamming activity because halfway through it changes to office president 2018 at gmail.com. And the bookkeeper goes to the CEO and says, Hey, did you want me to send this wire out? And the CEO goes, yeah, send it. And literally two weeks later, he wakes up and this is no joke. He literally wakes up in the middle of the night and was like, what fucking wire? <laughs> and, and he comes back and is like, what were you talking about? And it and, and comes up a million dollars. Okay. So the point of this is like, yes, you can have turning off drones and hacking all this other stuff. But a lot of this stuff that I see is like social engineering, like MGM, if you guys are familiar with that hack, right? Is a pure social engineering play where someone just called up the help desk. It's like, oh, I lost my credentials. Can you help me get them? 
And but you know, it, so it's I just kind of that's what expect you. Please it, tell me. Right. right. Yeah. And, and so it's figures. really I think when you're when you're talking about hacking, um, it's really interesting to see that like you, you don't actually need like technical expertise. Obviously it helps, but if you can make people believe your bullshit, you can technically hack. And as a security engineer, I always measure my controls on how much of the non-hacking that tr people are trying to do. That means that my, my doors are my door locks are good, right? If they're trying the windows, I've got a good door lock, right? That's how I always that's your thing. What? Yeah, okay, this is just pure chaos. And this happened at Vanderbilt University and the radio station was somewhat involved with it, but it wasn't me. I swear to God, I was not <laughs> involved with this one. Um one day in the late nineties, some um, um, either that Jacks appeared in and around the radio station and I'm like, okay, well, that's interesting. And oh, by the way, um, I used to run the Nashville chapter of 2600 and my radio show on the radio station was a big hangout for the hacking community in Nashville. Can you kind of see where this is going? Um, the Ethernet jacks appear one day in and around the radio station. I'm like, well, that's neat, but I'm busy doing the show and making a lot of noise and having fun. Um, the hacker kids, one in particular, I won't give his name, but it, uh, he was known as Mr. Destructo. <laughs> yeah, um, they break out the laptops and the Cat5 and the hubs, and they plug in and they start exploring. And there's a lot of snickering and laughter going on, but I don't care, I'm DJing, I'm having fun. And about four hours later, um, when my show's up, I was on Saturdays starting at midnight, we went to the wee hour Sunday morning and sometimes until the sun came up on Sunday. So I'm like, all right guys, show's over, um, next DJ's going to be coming in, setting up shortly, pack it up, let's go. And Mr. Destructo comes up with his big grin on his face and he says, so guess what we found out? Oh God, what? And he said, well, this is all Windows network here in Vanderbilt. We found all of these NT machines and, um, you know, they were all doing Windows file and network sharing. So, of course, we started sniffing port 127. And what we did was like machine B here. We would go in and find their porn collection and we would move machine B's porn collection onto machine C. <laughs> and we would take machine A's porn collection and move it onto machine B. And then we'd leave a text file on their desktop that said, machine B, you have machine A's porn collection and we've given your porn collection to machine C. You should share and explore new kinks. Bigger <laughs> exercise ever. <laughs> Okay. Or the best. Okay, I am taking my playlist here out of the book and I am tearing the sheet for today out of the station log and we were never here. You fucking morons. You did this during my show and none of us are supposed to actually be here. None of us were here, okay? Now, here's the fallout I found out years later, the other half of the story. These weren't students. These were professors' machines. And so apparently Vanderbilt Help Desk, where a lot of our other people were, they had a very busy Monday morning and there was a lot of explaining going on from all these professors whose machines were hacked and people uploaded porn to it because I would never put porn on my work machine. Yeah, yeah. So some people just want to cause chaos. So yeah, that's my story. And I wasn't involved. <laughs> okay. As far as somebody who's getting started with hacking, what would you suggest? How how would you just how would you suggest they start? I'll pass on this since I just told a story. <laughs> for a lot of purposes, we're talking about hacking computers. You gotta start by learning to code. What yeah. language, you, and, and so I say this a little selfishly because I really want to be more technologically savvy. What language did you recommend learning first? This is a controversial subject, but I would start in Python. There are not a resources for learning it. And uh, from there, if you want to dive into, well, making things go wrong on machines, you want to see. Yeah, there's still a lot of stuff in C that you can learn. 
um, and uh, it's a good place. But uh, yeah, but Rust is if you can if you can leap past C and go to Rust, that would be great. Uh, you're building stuff. I don't know. I know. Then, then you're actually building stuff. In the main, not, not breaking it. Um, so yeah, like I said, I'm you know in, I'm in the corporate world and you know try to to get lots of opportunities for new folks to come in and so you know really expand trying to expand the horizons right. We're working with companies all over the place to say, hey, stop looking at the you know the technical schools and look at everything else. We've got lots of really smart people that know lots of good things. So what do you need? A, a, a kind of fundamental technology skill, right? On the IT side, right? That's going to be how the machine works and how the network works. So, you know, operating systems, uh, TCP, IP, you know, always say, go get the, uh, go get your network plus and your security plus, right? That'll give you the foundations of how TCP, IP works. And then enough about security to know what you might like, what you might not like. And that'll, that'll at least get you there. And I've, I've hired people with just those certs that they got on their own. They maybe had played around with some of the uh, the hacking uh, websites and are just getting started, but it's it's passion, dedication, and uh, in that. But the, the foundational technical skills so that you can build on that once you get that job, and uh, that should get you in. Yeah, you know the the passion will will definitely take you there. I, I think um, uh, resources like Try Hack Me and Hack the Box Academy and um, Port Swigger Academy and just trying out these sort of entry level uh, capture the flag boxes and even looking at the walkthroughs for those and then taking notes on it and doing it again by yourself and then you know see what interests you you know you might like you might like web hacking more than binary exploitation which uh, CE would teach you a lot about and you know you might be interested in email stuff um, so just see what see what uh, sort of piques your interest and then just go down that rabbit hole and then just live in that rabbit hole for the rest of your life. So <laughs> yeah. Get out. I, I'm so glad you mentioned Troy Hackney. That, that that was gonna be my recommendation. Um basically uh yeah, my other recommendation would be get comfortable with virtualization technology uh or have some old laptops that you're comfortable re-imaging. And basically get your own sort of cyber range going. Uh, what what Trihackney offers is is you pretty much just go to their website and they have some virtual computers set up that you are allowed to hack, um, and, and they're giving you tutorials how to. Um, and, and so that saves you the trouble of having to set up your own infrastructure to have a place to safely try things out because you you don't want to do something like go to a library or McDonald's or a business and start messing around because you will get in trouble and. And you're also like, you know, you're hurting people who aren't uh, consenting to have their <laughs> devices involved in something like that. So get, yeah, get either an old device or or a virtual machine. Uh, if you're looking for virtual machines to hack, uh, I would recommend checking out Metasploitable. Uh, there's actually, I think, three different VMs of that available now, and it's meant to be hacked with a tool called Metasploit, which will probably be uh, d definitely that'll be in your arsenal if you start doing some testing. Yeah. It's a lot easier than it looks. I, I, if I dropped out of college like three times, I promise hacking is very easy. Uh, yeah, I want to add a historical note here. The original reason for a lot of the hacking, the old school hacking, happened because people simply didn't have access to hardware. Back in the olden days when everything was a mainframe, you know, people didn't have mainframes or many computers. The soft, uh, software was proprietary, it was closed source. There was no internet. Your network connection, quote unquote, might be a 300 baud modem if you were lucky. Um, it was all about in the early days simply getting access to these resources that we have an abundance now. Um, you mentioned the Network Plus and the Security Plus. Get the Linux Plus too. These are by CompTIA. Um, if you can't get old throwaway computers to throw various flavors of Linux and BSD on to play with in the network, um, single board computers, Raspberry Pi, uh, fives, even fours will work just fine. And um, if you're just starting out, get your A plus two, learn how to pick up old computer systems and refurbish them, get them working again so you can turn them into nodes on your home network, learn how to build your home network and go to town there. So those my two, yes, sir. Capture the flags. Oh my God, thank you for reminding me, capture the flag. There is actually um, one of the old EFF, um, assistant directors here, Keith Gordon was the chief of information security at Georgia Tech, and he helped develop a free and open source capture the flag program. We would love to bring in here to DragonCon 
and have running all week. We would love to have kind of like a walk-in at any point, 24 hours a day at Dragon Con, hacking lab, info lab, learn uh, or teach type lab. And if you, that's, that's, that's something you want to see, mention it in the Dragon Con app and in the reviews. We don't need a whole lot of space yeah. for this, and we do have people who are willing to do it. And, and what, I have one, one more thing. <clears throat> There is a there is a security community in so many communities in so many cities and, and areas of the country. Here in Atlanta, there are lots of meetups all all around Atlanta. Uh, so there are DefCon groups. So DefCon is a big hacking convention. If you haven't heard of it before, uh, there are local chapters here in Atlanta. We've got like four or five. The biggest one, DC four hundred four, has been meeting down at Manuel's Tavern for forever. Uh, there is the twenty six hundred group. Are you talking about Hugh Grand SE2600? That's how I got started. He's the one who got me. I'm not associated with it anymore. I, I do not recommend the national yeah, chat. I'm talking. sorry. And, uh, but you know, they also have, you know, Atlanta's been meeting. What's great about the Atlanta uh, 2600, at la uh, first Friday, last Friday? Uh, first Friday. First, Friday, first Friday, Friday every month at Linux Mall for over 30 years. Oh, over 30 years we've been meeting there. And so I, I went, you know, we used to drag computers and stuff and pay phones and stuff into the food court. And, you know, we, we, it's still going on. Still going on. Still going on. We have to come down here for one one day. Um, the Atlanta Linux enthusiasts, Hale, um, they've been going forever, too. They're a fantastic mailing list, meetup group. Um, Atlanta is one of, no joke, the best places in the country for InfoSec, for learning computers in general. Um, I've seen a bunch of mailing lists, a bunch of uh, resources say that, yeah, D.C., New York, Silicon Valley have all got decent-sized groups, but uh, Atlanta is supposed to be the best in the country. So B if you're here, this is the place for it. Mention B-Sides. Oh, B-Sides. B-Sides, yeah. yes, yeah. So B-Sides is uh, an interesting story about B-Sides. Uh, you know, the basic started in, in Vegas when uh, uh, Black Hat sold out and got all corporate. Uh, we only created B-Sides for the real talks. And then it, it it also franchised out, and every city's have got you know B sides conferences all over the world. It's great. Atlanta's got a great B sides. It's coming up here in October. Uh, you know, I'll be out there speaking. If you got Nashville a, has a good one in Nashville, the spring. Great. Oh, I went to the Nashville one. And they they have a great one in Nashville. Absolutely. September. So, September fourteenth for the Atlanta B sides. Thank you. I thought it was October. Thank you for listening. This almost yeah, sounds like a list feet. of. This almost sounds like a list of resources that we should compile and put on the uh, uh, DragonCon EFF website. Maybe we maybe we should do that for Scott. Good. Uh, now there may be some panelists who have some demos they would like to do. Does anybody have any for one on one, or is that all waiting for two on? I got. You have, you have a computer, you're just going to show everybody a thumb drive. Uh, there's a slide. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you have your computer set, right? Uh, no, I don't. So maybe, maybe 201. Sure. I've, I checked with them on um, what, what day were we here? Thursday. Time is a, a blur right now. And supposedly they've got a laptop over there that you can plug a thumb drive into and project onto the screen there. So tell us about what we're about to see. Um, basically, doing OSINT, uh, open source intelligence on industrial control systems through Shodan um, and finding exposed devices um, that you should. What's Shodan? Uh, they call it Google for hackers. It's just like it'll show hundreds of thousands of exposed devices, like routers and uh, maybe elevators and. Uh, File servers. For the love of God, please do not mess with the elevators here at Dragon Con or the escalators. Not during the convention, please. So I, I used to work for a cyber insurance startup where we had a very large security contingent that are very good. Um, we primarily used Binary Edge because um, the startup bought it, which is very similar to Shodan. And I remember one time one of our security leads was like, "Hey, look what I found." And it was the access panel to a geothermal electric plant in Europe. And it literally was just like they were able to get in. And like there was like buttons on 
shut down and and everything. And literally all they did was essentially a Google search to find them. Um, so Shodan, Binary Edge, things like that are very, very powerful. So from the legal perspective, not your attorney, but I am a attorney. Don't fuck with that. <laughs> okay. Uh, unless you're behind like seven proxies, even then. Don't you know, if y'all would like to comment, I hear rumors. These are just rumors that I hear. I don't know if they're true or not, that um, it's pretty much open season on anything Russian these days, particularly if you're willing to share that information with uh, our intelligence services or Ukrainian intelligence services, and our intelligence services would prefer that you have, if you have information that would help the Ukrainians you go through our people first, but I, that's just what I hear. I don't know if it's true. I'm definitely not involved with any of that. If any of y'all wish to comment on that, please do. And, and I would say from a legal perspective, this is one of those situations where you want to ask permission instead of forgiveness. Okay. Um, so if you do from not have like a line of communication with someone um, that knows what they're doing, it can give you some kind of immunity, preferably in writing and signed off by your attorney. Be very, 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 very careful. Always come to your ass, and if you don't know exactly what you're doing, it's probably safer if you don't quit. Seven boxes. I am a familiar session for uh, the hacking workshop. We have wireless mics. We should probably move them around a bit. I was just going to say, coming off of that, then. There was a guy who was in the early yeah. session who said he's actually in FBI and they have to be set up. If anyone actually wants to go to talk Yeah, to FBI them. booth is over in gaming, I believe, America's Mart. Um, they're, they're always recruiting. Um, Black Hat is an interesting place where you can run into people who have, might have interesting information for you um, and might have use for your talents if you have talents that are useful. Well, I think didn't the FBI just like tie for first or like finish one of the top places at DEF CON in their hacking competition? Or was that Black Hat? Sure. No. Okay. I, I have, actually have a question. So um, I'm not very experienced with hacking or anything, but I do feel with most people that I know, um, I wouldn't say really necessarily uh, are part of a political spectrum. But the fact that we're in Dragon Con right now, like I would say it's chaotic good, right? And um, and I, th I feel like everyone in that field has that sort of same mentality. It's very humanitarian and cares about shit. Have y'all working in the field met anyone that is actually on the opposite end of being uh, just purely chaotic or evil or um, have been do using their powers? Unless they're just working for the, like, I mean, I guess maybe it's possibly the, the institution that exists that is already evil and using that. But um, I don't know, I just, I'm interested from that, like, people are working for it, but people who are on the chaotic side of it, like, do you, have you met people like that? I've got yeah. a pretty good story around those lines. Um, I started working for a company called Bit9, uh, yeah, 15 years ago or so, maybe, and uh, just started as a security company, they had um, uh, great software, and uh, I started, maybe two weeks later, I got an email saying, hey, FYI, we're going to reset everybody's password. Like, oh, crap, we just got hacked. And it was true. We, we got breached. Uh, so I just joined a company, went through the breach fund. And what had happened is uh, Bit9 you know, locks down uh, you know, cut, uh, endpoints and secures them. And we didn't have a software on a particular, soft, a particular server that happened to have our signing keys. Kind of important to have. It was a big screw up on our site. Um, and the reason I bring this up is that, you know, it really drives home why this job is so important to me. The people that hacked us were the, it was led back and is probably going to be the Chinese military or the Chinese government. And the reason that they hacked us is to get at one of our customers. Our customers are running our software. They could not get in. And then, so they hacked the security company that was securing that company. And these companies that were uh, targeted by this particular threat actor where legal companies, legal uh, the companies that helped Chinese dissidents come into the U.S. or other places in the, uh, around the world and help them reintegrate into society. So this was the Chinese government 
going after Chinese dissidents that were trying to hide from the Chinese government and that these people probably, you know, were disappeared or, you know, sent off to camps. And so while we talk about money and hacking and all this stuff, the, that hack might have caused lies to be lost. And so it is just one of those just, you know, when you, when you point that out, like the, 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 the ugliness of this, it's not just uh, people wanting to see the world burn. Uh, there are threat actors out there that really uh, are on that side of the fence. And so just drives that point home that, that we, we do good work by uh, securing you know, companies. Yeah, the bad guys are usually traditionally regarded as the Chinese, the Russians, the North Koreans, the Iranians, the Saudis are getting up there, and then, then there's our frenemies in Mossad. So, um, yeah, they tend to do some pretty bad stuff. Uh, we're not you know, all pure and goodness and everything. Uh, a guy I know who, I'm trying, I don't want to say his name. Uh, let me say, let me put it this way. Um, he used to work for um, it ISS, ISSA, the big security company here in Atlanta. Um, he's been a keynote speaker at not DEF CON, but at Black Hat. And he goes in and he consults with um, uh, not the Joint Chiefs of Staff, but people who report to them about three or four times a year now on cybersecurity guys. This, this guy knows his shit. He's like, when I think of the word hacker, this guy has earned it. He is one of the most intelligent guys I've ever met and has probably forgotten more than I'll ever know. And he said when he worked um, at ISS and the standard business model for a lot of security companies was they poke around with commercial products, they find flaws, they find holes in them, and then they'll reach out. And he said it was like working for the mafia. The, the bosses would reach out to these companies and say, hey, we found this issue in your software and we can sell you the fix we've come up with. Sure would be a shame if someone released like a GUI version for script kiddies out in the open. Wouldn't that be a shame? Do you want to buy our solution now? And apparently this is very common, at least it was at the time, about 15, 17 years ago when a lot of the information security worked. North Koreans in particular are notorious for running uh, basically a bunch of money-making operations via hacking in the ransomware space and the cryptocurrency space. So then it, at some point, finances a not trivial fraction of their state. So yeah, there, there are evil actors out there. And I've met some, I swear, pure chaos piece out there as well. If you want to read about some of the DPRK actors, go to Google Cloud's blog. Some of my teammates do amazing, like, cutting-edge work on that. Um, they understand those actors better than anybody else in the industry. And they, uh, yeah, those those guys fund themselves. Uh, like that, They are paying for their own infrastructure that they use to do more hacking with the profits from their previous hacking. The government doesn't give them money in a lot of cases. They there is something something like hundreds of millions of dollars a year. In yes, it, land. It's, it's, it's a lot of money. Crazy. And and then, you know, the profits from that are directly funding weapons purchases. Yeah, it was really interesting, like talking about like the government thing. So again, my company and what I've worked in, like we get a lot of ransomware claims. Um, February 2022, the company I was at, we were getting like maybe eight to 15 ransomware claims a day. And then Russia invades Ukraine and it went to like zero, not, not a day, like a week. Okay. And if you look at the cyber insurance space from 2022, it like the, the frequency and severity of hardcore hacks and ransomware went way, way down. Right. Well, Russia typically, um, if you join their military, you're signed to a year contract. Okay, guess what ramped up like crazy in February of 2023? Signers. Ransomware <laughs> attacks, things like that, um, because all the hackers were either browbeaten or somehow involved in, I mean, it's all why Conti got imploded, right? Um, to, to work for the Russian government and attack Ukrainian infrastructure. And then they're like, wait, I mean, our contract's up. We got to go back to ransoming like US based organization. Surprise, you are conscripted to do net hacking stuff. The conscription is pretty brutal. Yeah, no, no, that's a really good point. It was just very interesting because it was like, 
it was like someone just turned a light switch, you know, in regards to ransomware. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh, wait, it's been a year. We're just going to flip that bitch back on. And, um, you know, we've seen a lot of increase in severity and frequency since. I just Oh, yeah, I was, I'm just more curious about the uh, consequence of any sort of like country and or entity outside the U.S. taking that type of action. Like what would we potentially do in response to something like that where we can uh, clearly see that like, you know, sanctions or whatever other things. But there are anything we do behind the scenes from like a technology standpoint to try to stop and or fight back. Yeah, so we've actually seen a huge increase in law enforcement action against ransomware threat actors. Um, the biggest one is probably to take down a Lockbit. Um, and if you guys don't know, Lockbit was one of the most, um, like a better term, prestigious ransomware variants. They're ransomware as a service. Um, but they recently, a couple months ago, the U.S. government did something that they've never done before. But they actually sanctioned an individual associated with the ransomware variant. So I, I forget his name. It's very Russian. But supposedly the, the, the individual responsible for Lockbit has been sanctioned. He's on the SDN list, Department of Treasury, FinCEN. And for the first time, the Department of Justice actually said, this individual gets like 20 to 30% of all lockbit payouts. So up until this point, no ransomware variant was sanctioned. So technically a payment to a ransomware threat actor is legal, okay? Unless you can associate it with someone that's on a sanctioned list. And what they do is they'll be like, oh, hey, here's a new Bitcoin address. And we're not affiliated with them, even though there's some IOCs that might be indicative of that. So you have plausible deniability. But now for the first time, if you are associated with Lockbit, you can't pay a ransom in the US. Now there's some things there where, you know, the Lockbit source code got leaked about a year and a half, two years ago. And so there's different variations. So if you have the most up-to-date Lockbit, like malware on your system, then technically you're not legally allowed to pay that ransom. But if it's free leak source code, you have possible deniability where you can say, hey, this might not actually go to this individual. So there's service providers who will say, all right, OFAC clears, we can make this payment. Okay, let's get to some slides. All right. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna be presenting on industrial control systems and finding exposed devices through showdown. Um, so industrial control systems, basically it's all of the infrastructure that kind of runs human civilization. Um, this is a water treatment plant, um, anything you can think of like the power grid and traffic lights and elevators in a hotel, things like that. Um, those are industrial control systems or ICS. And uh, they mainly run on programmable logic controllers, uh, also called PLCs. And um, I don't know if you can see that, but um, just little computers that just send a command that says, you know, um, open the valve, you know, turn the temperature down, turn the lights off, make the elevator go up and down. And um, this is all over the world, every city, pretty much every city in the world, almost every major building in the world. And they're controlled through, uh, they're controlled through HMIs, human machine interfaces. And Rich, like you were saying, like, It'll just have a button like start, stop, um, you know, somewhere in this building or maybe they're working remotely is someone looking at the Marriott Marquee HMI to control the PLC that makes the lights in this room and the HVAC and the water and all that stuff. And these are being hacked all the time, every day uh, through cyber criminals, through activists and through nation state actors. So uh, what I want to talk about is Shodan, um, like I said, Google for hackers. Um, Google searches the web and Shodan searches the internet. And Google has web pages like HTTP and HTTPS. Shodan is uh, any device connected to the internet, uh, like routers and uh, industrial control and file servers and any of that. So if you just, just go into the image page, um, hold on. So it'll be, you'll have, you'll see login pages, you'll see cameras. Um, there's a, a parking lot, there's like a break room and an office or something. And so with a lot of these login pages, cyber criminals will brute force the password. And then if they get in, it might be into an internal corporate network. And in which case they would escalate the domain. And um, that's when they deploy the ransomware and extort them for 
millions of dollars. Um, that was that it's kind of skewed there, but that's a chemical plant in Iran. And I just took the screenshot like two hours before I got here. Um, that's a water treatment facility. Um, so this I searched for the PLCs. I searched for a specific one, the Honeywell Backnet Direct, and that's building automation control. And that's something that it's exposed to the internet. I could get in there. I could tamper with it. I could turn the lights off in a building. And if there was one on there that said Atlanta Marriott Marquis, any 12 year old in blue space pajamas in their brand new basement could could change the administrative password and, and turn off the lights of this building. <laughs> Except not my 13 year olds open. Oh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. You, you specifically. <laughs> um, so um, this was a HVAC in Germany. These are all the screenshots from showing you. HVAC in Germany. Um, this is like a house, I think. Uh, I'm not sure what that is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That might be pretty geothermal. Yes. Yeah. Fish tank. <laughs> Sprinkler. Yeah. Um, okay. And then uh, this is a uh, some kind of pump in Australia. Yeah. And then um, yeah, just on, off, all the stuff, uh, solar panel. So, yeah, like Rich said, you know, this is educational purposes only. Um, if you if you access these and you tamper with anything, you could get caught and you could get prosecuted. And if you try to come back to me and say I told you to do it, <laughs> I, that's not going to hold up in court, and you're going to have to, <laughs> you, you're gonna have to pay fifty thousand to a lawyer and all this stuff. So um, if you are an asset owner um, and your stuff is exposed to the internet, make sure you have secure remote access and multi-factor authentication and maybe a hardware authentication like a UB key or something like that, and just check and see if it's on Showdown. And um, yeah, and so this is just to show you how easy hacking can be because you're not doing coding, you're not doing anything, you're just pressing on and off. And so Well, that's fucking terrifying. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So here's the line of the Showdown specifically and similar uh, similar tools. Um, they they are based on uh, they scan the whole internet. Anything that's open, you know, they, they will just collect information from it. That's legal, obviously, because there's companies doing it at scale. They'd be sued out of existence by now if it wasn't. You can read the information on Showdown. What you can't do legally is connect directly to you know the, those IP addresses that are showing up there and start pushing buttons. So you can read the results, acting upon them is, is where the line would be crossed. I'm not a lawyer. It's not technically legal advice. That's my understanding of it. Not legal advice, but he's right. <laughs> Real quick, yes. yes. So you're saying that it's legal to get on there and just, for the cameras, just lawyer your ass off at whatever it is. No, so yeah. so Shodan possibly collects a screenshot ah. as part of their collection. If it's showing up on Shodan's platform, you can view it. Do not connect to the camera and view the live stream. Okay, it's, that's where the just stay, just stay on Shodan's website. Right, look exactly. around, get scared, show your neighbors, friends. You know, have a laugh. Just don't go off of Showdown's website. So know. how long before Showdown gets in trouble putting those screenshots up for people to see? I, they've so, been there forever. I mean, yeah. uh, Census. I mean, there's several companies. Showdown's not the only player in in the in, in out there. They're just the one most biggest and most popular. Uh, and and all the bad guys are doing it too. So it's it's you know everything gets scanned. You plug a uh, Windows XP device up to the internet, it'll get hacked within minutes, right? So it it and there are yeah, so it, it, this but this is just a is a great resource to kind of show. Uh, kind of, you know, the, the wild and crazy world of, you know, people plugging stuff up to the internet thinking, yeah, nobody, I didn't tell anybody about this IP address. They're not going to know. Who's going to know? It's also great for researchers. I'm a cyber threat intelligence researcher. Guess whose stuff also has to be on the internet? The bad guy's infrastructure. If they're serving malware from something, I find it on census. If they're hosting all the loot on the server. I'm going to find it. I figure out who the victims are. We contact them. We get them notified and remediated. So, we can use it for good too. It's, it's not all scary. The bad guys are just as vulnerable as we are. Just a comment. Those of you who've heard Internet of Things, IoT, the S stands for security. <laughs> so I, I would just, I would probably just add one thing. And there are, depending upon the jurisdiction you live in, accessing a publicly available website, whether it's a webcam or whatever, 
is not technically illegal. Again, this is going to vary based upon your jurisdiction. Do your own due diligence. Talk to a lawyer that's qualified in the jurisdiction that you live in, and potentially even qualified in the jurisdiction where the asset is located. But if there's an IP address that's open to the world, without, and you don't have to do anything except click on that, generally that's not illegal. Now, if you go in there and you start moving things around or pressing buttons and a hydroelectric dam stops working, that's potentially illegal. I need to step in for a minute and let everyone know um, it's 1230. The panel is technically over. If you need to be somewhere else, this is probably the time for you to take off. Um, we can go over a little bit. We're not going to go over very long because these fine folks who are running this room have been here all day and they probably want to go party or go to sleep. So whenever you're ready, just tell us to shut the hell up and throw us out. It's all good. Five minutes. Five, five minutes. Uh, let's let's get comments in from audience and panelists. We'll continue in Hacking 201 where we can go into yeah, more come detail. Back, come back tomorrow, Hacking 201. We've got plenty of time to answer. DFS track room over in uh, Hilton. What is it? Three. Four, three. 313, 10 o'clock tomorrow night, and we can go as long as we want. So I had, a, I had a quick question about hacking culture in general, how it's changed, right? The access to information is so much greater now than it used to be. Enormously, yes. Right, so how has that influenced? What do you think the influence of access to information has changed hacking culture? Do you think it's created better hackers, more hackers, scarier people? Yes, all of the above. All of the above. It's the best of times, it is the worst of times. And I, I've got a question as well. Uh, I appreciate the information about Shovan. It is a great application. Is there anything better that you've seen as far as a tool is concerned? Other than that, it's it's clear what you're using it for. Like there's gonna be some of their services that didn't mean like specifically about like other area. I mean something better than that particular solution for that purpose. Well, that's Zoom, I, purpose. Zoom I and Census are both. I, for for screenshots, I like show down the best. And Zoom I is connected more with Hong Kong, but uh, or Zoom I Census show down. Yeah, if you're you're on the corporate side, if you're on the corporate side, Census is a little bit more legal friendly. My 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 third party risk people like freaked out when they tried we tried to onboard show down. Uh, but since this, they're like, okay, this makes it. So yeah, it, and, and so yeah, if you're if you work for a big company, I have to look at since. Yeah, sure. All right. On that, we've got yep. like two minutes left. Anyone want to get a final comment or question here that we can answer quicker tonight? Right here. Oh, <laughs> Yeah. Just as a point, uh, you know, I keep hearing the question, how dangerous are people with access to the uh, skills and technologies? Uh, I served in the Marine Corps from 2004 to 2011. I worked in signals intelligence during the Al-Ambar campaign in Iraq. Yeah. Anti-human trafficking is probably one of the biggest operations that we engaged in because a lot of that's money funds further terror, acts of terror. So... There are scarier things than people stealing your money. Yeah. All right, we're going to go ahead and call it for tonight. Uh, rate the panel, please, in the app, and please come to Hacking 201 tomorrow night. Thanks. Nice. <laughs>